We went to Bellinson Hospital to meet three of the recipients. And one of them, of course, was Lital, who was the heart recipient. And she said to me, uh, by the way, Rabbi D, said, my name is not Lital. It's, I would, my given name is Rina Lital, which was really quite spooky. Um, when hmm. I spoke to the mother of the 25-year-old boy who received the liver, who up to that point had never in his life been able to get out of bed for more than a few hours because he'd had this problem, uh, and was on his deathbed really the next week or two, um, she came up to me and said, thank you, Rabbi D. She said, uh, I said, what's your name? She, uh, she said, my name's Maya. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And this week's guest is someone that I was honestly nervous to interview because he so recently lost his beloved wife and two daughters in a terrible terror attack. And I reached out to my now friend, Hill Fold, who... I know, uh, knows Rabbi D. And I said, listen, I want to be sensitive. I know when the right time is, but whenever the right time is, I would love to have a conversation with Rabbi D after I saw his his uh, speeches by the Leviahs. And I got the message the past week that Rabbi D is ready to talk. And we had this conversation. It is... It wasn't easy to have, and the strength that Rabbi D has is truly an inspiration. This episode is in memory of Shemin David Ben Yaakov Shleima, Miriam Sarabas Yaakov Moshe, and as well, um, a few people found out about this episode, people who listen and love the show and know who Rabbi D is, maybe not personally, but they feel connected to him because he's part of Kalal Yisrael, so they wanted to... Um, sponsor this episode in memory of Rabbi D's Rebetzin, Lucy and his two daughters, Maya and Rina, their neshama Shahav and Leah. Here is my conversation with Rabbi D. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, today I am joined with Rabbi Leo D. Rabbi D, thank you so much for doing this. I, I understand that it's still a very sensitive time, so I appreciate you coming on to talk about all the things that we're going to talk about today. Okay. I want to go, I guess, from your beginning, where did you grow up and what's your background and how did you start your family life? I grew up in a uh, conservative family. Uh, we're members of the Reform in England, uh, which was very much like a sort of conservative shul um, in America today. Um, the rabbi was a Holocaust survivor called Hugo Grin, a very charismatic man who was an inspiration to me. We had the first woman rabbi, Rabbi Jackie Tabak, um, and she was effectively an Orthodox rabbi, but she was a woman, so she became a, a reform rabbi. Um, and she taught me my bar mitzvah. Um, and I gradually became more religious over time. Um, a number of different influences in my life that sort of brought me to uh, orthodoxy. Was that scary for you coming from, you know, your background and reform background than to just take on just more orthodoxy? Was there some pushback? Was there fear? How, how was that transition? I think my, my parents are very open minded. My parents both came from religious families themselves. Um, they sort of lapsed a little bit and uh, effectively jumped a generation. So um, I think they were very comfortable with, with uh, what decisions I made. Um, but uh, we had, for example, a rabbi came to my school. I went to a Christian school and um, a, rabbi, a little uh, rabbi with a, a violin who'd play some songs, tell some jokes, give a Devar Torah, and there'd be a Jewish assembly. It was, it was a Catholic school where there was a quota of 10% Jews. So there were 700 boys in the school, 70 exactly were Jewish. 20 boys in my class, two exactly were Jewish. That was the type of school I went to. The school had been around since the time of Henry VIII, 500 years. It was a, it was a sort of traditional British public school, which I guess you'd call private school. Um, but it was an established school. And um, yeah, and uh, that was my... So first introduction to orthodoxy was this rabbi who'd come when I was about 12, 13 years old to do Jewish assemblies. I'm actually curious, was your, I mean, I, I've seen a bunch of interviews with you, you have a strong, deep connection to Israel. Was that uh, prominent throughout your childhood or that came more later on in life? So interestingly, you see, my mother's father uh, and my father's father both came from Riga, which was, sounds like coincidence, except they met at 
the Baltic Bull, which was the bull for Jews who'd come from Riga, so that's how they met. And um, my mother's father studied in a Ben Yehuda school in Riga, which meant that he studied in Ivrit, in modern Hebrew, in the 1910s, uh, which is really quite astounding considering the state didn't exist until 1948. Um, and literally, he was one of the first people in the world to, to study uh, in modern Hebrew. And, um, and because of that, he was a translator for one of the signatories to the Bill of Independence um, in 1948. And he came over in the 1930s in order to be his translator into Hebrew. So he was an early uh, 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 aliyah, basically, into, into Palestine. Uh, but he left in 1939 to go and study in England. And because of the war, he got married and he stayed there. He never went back. So that was my mother's side. My father's side, um, my father's grandfather uh, was a very wealthy man. Uh, his name was Betzalel Dvalitsky. Dvalitsky became D. And he left in the 1930s, early 1930s, to Palestine. And he set up a chocolate factory in Ramat Gan, which was called Tzedeh, um, which he sold out to elite um, in the 1960s. So effectively, the chocolate that's sold today was established by my uh, great-grandfather in the 1960s. He's like the Willy Wonka of Israel. He was the Willy Wonka of Israel. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So could you tell us about, I guess, your career a little and as well as your when you met Lucy and uh, were you set up? Did you happen to meet each other? What was that experience like? Right. Well... Uh, I'll tell you a bit about my uh, career. I was basically a sausage factory kid. Um, so what does that mean? I went to this private school. The private school basically churned out kids who went to Oxford and Cambridge. I was one of the kids who went to Cambridge. Um, uh, Lucy's one of the kids who went to Oxford. In those days, there was, there was a path. And in 1994, when I finished, there was another path that if you came out in 1994, you became a management consultant. So I became a strategy consultant. Um, and then if you were a strategy consultant, you became a, a venture capitalist. So I became a venture capitalist. Uh, and then you did management buyouts because that was the next stage up. And so I found myself on this sort of treadmill uh, of what people would call success, except that I got to the age of about 32 and I decided that this wasn't the treadmill I really wanted to be on. So I was promoted um, to director of this private equity company, a $1 billion fund. And uh, the next day after I got my bonus, I quit. And I said, I'm going to Israel, I'm going to become a rabbi. So that, that's basically my career. Uh, started for four years, came back to England for six years as a rabbi, uh, basically as a Rebbitzin. And I was the tag along because my wife was really <laughs> the, main, the main deal. I was really her uh, assistant. Um, she really, she was uh, full of hospitality, arranging uh, events in the shul, bringing people together, making a massive impact. I would be the one who'd say a few words. And, uh, and that, was our, that was how we worked as a team. And um, yeah, that was it. Then we came back to Israel after that six years. And since then, I've been doing a number of different jobs, which may be interesting to talk about later, because everything I've done, I've done 20 jobs probably in the last 30 years. Um, and if you'd have asked me why I would have done them, I did them because they're interesting to me. If you ask them now, my current capacity and the things I'm trying to achieve now, every single thing I've done has actually been useful to me in some way or other. And so you know, in retrospect, uh, it's quite amazing how, you know, Hashem has, has worked in, in my life. I mean, except for one particular day, which I'd like to sort of put out of my mind. Yeah. Okay. So I will ask you at the end of how everything just uh, came together to bring you to what you're currently working on mm -hmm. and your current goals are. But I hate to bring it up because um, I don't want to make you sad or uncomfortable. But I, I do want to, you know, go through your experience and, and I guess also the lessons you've learned from it. But for those who don't know, and, and I, I think a lot of people do know, could you take us back to that day? So the 7th of April, um, we just celebrated a, a wonderful state of the night with my parents uh, around the table. And uh, the seven of us, uh, so the nine people had a beautiful state of the night. Uh, we have sheets that we prepare before every Seder where we have questions that people prepare beforehand. Um, and then when we get to different parts of the Seder, we read out our answers. So we have a discussion about different topics. For example, when it comes to Dayenu, we have, you know, what are five things you're happy about? Um, or what are the five things you'd like to, to thank the person who's one above you in the family uh, about? Uh, what are you grateful for? 
um, write a 10 word uh, WhatsApp of people coming through the, uh, the Red Sea. This is based basically on a Haggadah that I got from a Rabbi um, uh, Arya Ben David, uh, which I think is available in Amazon, which is fantastic. He actually gives one sheet. We bought this about five, 10 years ago. And uh, since then, I've been making our own sheets every year, which give different questions. So it's a wonderful atmosphere. We've got five teenagers around the table. We've got my parents, and, and, and this is a wonderful Pesach. And then the next day, we finish off because you know, we had so much to talk about. We, we completed it over lunch on, on Yontif. Uh, then my parents go back to their flat in Jerusalem. Um, and then the next morning, which is the first day of, of uh, Cholam Oed, uh, we're driving up to Tiberias to basically have a lovely family holiday with my parents, my sister and her, uh, her, her two sons who are here as well. Um, and we're driving up in three cars. So Lucy's driving up with Ma and Rina in one car. I'm driving up with um, Yehuda and Tali in a second car. Karen was dropped off by Lucy on the way at her, um, at her orphanage, basically where she works. Um, and she's staying there for Shabbat. And my parents um, come with my sister and the nephews um, in a third car, but an hour later. As I'm driving up, um, I get a call from my sister, who's an hour behind us. And she says, there's been an attack on the road. And apparently the driver said to us to go a different route. Are you OK? So I said, we're fine. Um, and of course, I immediately called Lucy to see if she was OK. So I call her number, no answer. I call Maya's phone, no answer. I call Rena's phone, no answer. Now I've got Google Family Link. I can track Maya and Rena. I see that they're at the Hummer Junction, which is where we know this attack occurred. At the same time, my son has access to some website. Unfortunately, in Israel, there is such a website where there's pictures of uh, attacks that happen. And there's a picture of a white car. They were in a white car. And there's a picture of a bullet hole and some blood on a bag sitting on the back of the car. It's our swim bag, which is very, no, very recognizable. And so we suddenly know what, what has happened. So I turn around. Um, there's a police blockade in this particular road because uh, there's traffic and you can't turn right. I push past the policeman and the policeman bangs on my car and says, you know, show me your, your license. I shouted to him. I think it's my wife and my kids in the car. Uh, that's but just been attacked in, in the in the Pigua, the attack uh, down in Hamra. He says, go, go now, don't ask any questions, just go. I zoomed down at full speed, um, was, but we were probably at this point about half an hour, uh, 45 minutes away. So we get there, uh, I don't know, about 45 minutes, maybe an hour later. Um, there's police there, there's army there, there's ambulances there. I run towards the car to see whether it's the car, if it's them. We, we don't want to believe it is them. Um, the police pulled me back, the, the army pulled me back. They say, um, it's not good if you see this, it will not be good for you. Um, I try and run forward, they push me back. Um, eventually, after sitting in an ambulance waiting for about half an hour, I say, look, I need some proof that it's them because I can't believe it. And they bring me Maya's um, ID card, and then I know the truth. Uh, at this point, we knew that um, the mother had been flown to Ain Karim Hospital. So I get in the car and I zoom off to... Uh, to uh, Ain Karen with, the, with Tali and with uh, Yehuda in the car. Tali has difficult conversations to have with the grandparents in England, Lucy's parents in England and her brother and her sisters. She calls her and she says uh, uh, that uh, Maya and uh, Maya and Rina are dead and Lucy is in hospital with bullet wounds. And uh, that, that's, you know, that's like impossible. Karen, of course, has come from her orphanage uh, in Jerusalem. She's been, uh, been told by Tali to go straight to end Kerem so she can see mum. Um, and then Karen calls Tali to say, uh, what's happened to Maya and to Rita? And, and Tali says the words, Baruch Diana met. She says that, uh, you know, which, which means they're dead. And, um, you know, so, so Karen is unconsolable. She's fortunately got some support there. Um, we turn up at the hospital. Uh, Lucy is wheeled into operating room. Uh, the first announcement after a few hours of operation is they removed the two bullets and things are looking good, whatever that means. Um, and then, of course, what happened was two days later, um, they told us that she, uh, she hadn't survived. So that was the sequence of events. What, like emotionally, what were you thinking then? Because, you know, I've spoken to people before who've, who've gone through, you know, losing one loved one and sometimes when they're expecting it or, you know, there's, they're sick. But how do you, like, how did you emotionally go through the shock of losing two daughters and, I, I think, you know, I think that, you know, I'm still in denial. I think that it's now eight weeks later and it's beginning to hit. So, 
you know, the tears are coming much more than they were before. Um, but it, it's such an un- incredible thing to happen that you can't believe it. So actually, for, for many weeks, you're, you're in complete denial. And um, you know, people complain, my friends complain, that I've been talking too much. Whenever I go on a walk, I go, I go on a walk after Shachrit with a, lot of, with a friend, and then I often meet with different people during the day. <clears throat> and of course, I speak to a lot of the press all the time, and I talk and I talk and I talk and I talk, and people say to me, you never listen. And I said, look, if you lose one parent, Rahman al you know, God forbid, then you have one week of shiva where you're allowed to just talk. I said, if you lost three people, then you should have three weeks. I said, if you lose three people in a tragic situation, you should have six to nine weeks. So I said, I'm still in the shiva period where I'm just talking. Um, so I feel like I'm just coming out of that period where I, I have to talk the whole time and I can actually listen a little bit, which um, you know, is a first. How have you, you seem like so calm in the past few weeks with obviously this big shakeup. Is there, is it a response? Is it a factor of a moon and betachan? Like what's the it's, secret it's a number to calmness? Of things. I, I, yes, I mean, I, I mentioned at the Levi that I've listened for 10 years to Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg's Emunah Shirim. And, you know, one particular shir or many shirim, he says, you know, I don't know why I'm telling you this again. He says, after, you know, five, I've told you 500 times, he says, every shir I give, he says, is exactly the same thing. He says, look at the good and don't look at the bad. That is what we call emunah. So I, it was, that was ringing my head and I was thinking, Baruch Hashem, I've got, I've got three kids, got three lovely kids. I've got my parents. Uh, I've got my sister and my nephews here. The whole family descended. I'm blessed with a wonderful life, with wonderful uh, neighbors here in Efrat. Um, people are taking care of us. Uh, there's huge amounts of love. And then I've got the whole love of, of Am Yisrael, the whole Jewish people suddenly around me as well. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, we're so blessed. Um, and if you look at the good, then it's, um, you know, that, that, that does help. Um, I'll tell you something else, though, which I haven't talked about before. Um, when I was at school, at this uh, Catholic school, um, I was bullied. Age um, 12, 13, which was the high school age, <clears throat> I was a year ahead. I was put a year ahead when I was about five because my primary school teacher said, you know, he could, he could be a year ahead. So I was short. As everybody was growing, I was shorter and I was also top of the class. Um, and so that was not a good combination in this particular school. So I had my three friends, three or four friends. Um, and then the rest of the class basically ganged up against me behind a couple of ringleaders. So I would turn up to school, and this was every day for two years. Um, they would line down the corridor, and they would grab my bag and throw it around the room. They would push me around. They would uh, uh, spit balls at me during the lessons. Um, so it was pretty harassing. Um, I, um, you know, the, it was sometimes a little, a little bit violent. Um, but my mother said to me at the at the Leviah for uh, Maya and Farina, the first Leviah, she said, Leo, she said, this is you know, the only second time I've ever seen you cry. So I said, Mom, when was the first time? She said, that day you came back from school and they told you they were going to throw you down the stairwell. So that was after two years. It got so bad that the ringleaders actually threatened to kill me. At that point, I cried and my parents were aware of the problem. And then they involved the headmaster and the, and the housemaster and the teachers. And, and it didn't get that much better, but it meant that I, you know, my life wasn't in danger. So that was the end of that. And then obviously after about a year or so, I grew to the same height as everybody else and it all finished, it all sort of wavered out. But I obviously bottled it up inside me and I, I sort of had dealt with it somehow. And I feel that, you know, at the time it was a tremendous trauma, but now I think, thank God I had that because I obviously learned some skills at the age of 12, 13, very formative uh, years of my life, how to deal with trauma. So when I came across this trauma, you know, I had in my mind some program that said, you know, you have to get through it, you have to survive it, you have to uh, thrive through it, you have to move forward. Um, so sometimes, you know, you have these terrible trials in your life, which you think, why does it happen to me? And then only you have the benefit, you know, 30, 40 years later to look back and say, thank God it happened to me. I'm not sure that I'll ever say that about the tragedy on the 7th of, J- of April, but, uh, you know, certainly in terms of the bullying episode, I can certainly see that it has helped me through this period. Wow, that's an incredible lesson. What was, what were you going through when, you know, your two daughters, you found out that they were murdered, but then there was, there was a, a glimpse of hope for your wife. Like, what were you, like, did, what were you feeling? 
mixed emotions, to be honest. Um, you know, she had a bullet in her brainstem and a bullet in her sixth uh, vertebra, I think. And um, when I, you know, spoke to doctors and got some truth out of them, um, they said that a good prognosis was she might be alive, but she would not be able to move. And Lucy used to love to hike. We used to hike every Thursday together in the Dead Sea. Uh, we used to hike on holidays. We used to hike, you know, all the time. She loved hiking. Um, we used to swim. Um, she was very active. She went to the gym three times a week. Um, you know, she would have been miserable uh, to be lying there blinking her eyelids. And um, I know that you've had previous guests I've, I've heard um, who are in the situation where their spouse is in that situation. Um, you know, every tragedy, I think you think about it, you think, I couldn't cope with that tragedy. Um, and I think in a way it would have been worse if, if, you know, I had to be sitting there now by her bedside watching her flicking her eyelids um, rather than the situation that we are in now. Um, which is terrible, maybe a terrible thing to say, but that's, uh, you know, it would have been worse for her, it would have been worse for the kids, it would have been worse for me, and, and, and that's uh, the unfortunate reality. Do you, do you feel that it's harder or easier to be in the position that you are in the fact that you're the father of the family, you're the leader of the family, is, does that make your position easier? The fact that you need to be the stronger person or the strongest person because you have your 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 three kids and they're going through, you know, as much or maybe even more than you personally. Is that a harder role for you? Or is that an easier role for you? It, it, it's a strange thing to say, but it's a fact that um, you know uh, Lucy and Maya and Rena. Um, Lucy got in closer with Maya and Rena. That's why they're in the car with her. Um, and, uh, and I guess Karen and Tully and Yehuda were more daddy's kids in that sense. That's why they were in the car with me in that particular trip. So I guess in a sense, um, it made it easier, uh, for me that, uh, these were the th three kids who, um, you know, naturally had a, had a greater connection with me at that point. And we have, you know, that sort of bond. Um, had it been the other way around, which of course it could have been. I mean, strangely, you know, we followed Waze on the route and Waze took us um, along the complicated route up to Tiberias. Now, normally it takes you straight up the 90, which is a straight road. And it directed both me and Lucy um, along the side road, which takes an extra, you know, usually five, 10 minutes and is much more tiring. And the strange thing is that, you know, I had in my ears when it directed me that route, um, I had Lucy's voice in my ear saying, take the easier route, even if it's a little bit longer, um, it's less stressful for you as the driver. And she'd usually be sitting on the other side. Um, and so I changed the route and it was two minutes shorter. So not only was it uh, you know, easier, but it was two minutes shorter than the first route that, that Waze had given me. Um, Lucy, and that's why I couldn't believe she would be at this Hammer Junction because it wasn't on the route. Um, she obviously didn't change the route. And that was like bizarre because normally she would have gone the 90. So, um, you know, goodness knows how these decisions were made. In fact, I'll tell you honestly that um, one of the Shabbat guys, the Mossad guys, called me and said, you know, uh, wanted me to explain this whole situation because he felt it could be that there was a, an insider working for one of the technology companies, let's say, um, that was directing us there on purpose. And, and they wanted to check that possibility. I don't know if they found somebody. That's, uh, that's really wild. <laughs> From your perspective, why do you think that so many Jews come together when there's a tragedy, but more so when, you know, there's a tragedy with your family, your three loved ones that are tragically killed? Okay, why so, is there so much unity? So, so ya Yaakov, there are two, two answers to that. So don't know when, why, why was, why was this tragedy worse than other tragedies or, or, or perceived to be in a, on a global sense? Um, so I'll tell you, I think there are three factors that came together. Number one, there were three people. Had there been one, it's more like a personal tragedy. Had there been two, it's like a family tragedy. If there are three, it's a national or an international tragedy, just in terms of numbers. Number two, there were three women. And as you see, there were very, three beautiful women. So I think that made a big impact. Uh, and number three, they were British. Okay, ignore the Israeli side of it. They were British as well. So three British women was what made the story. Had there been three beautiful Israeli women, uh, it wouldn't have made the headlines anywhere for more than you know five minutes. 
um, and had there been three British men, it wouldn't have made the headlines for more than 10 minutes. Um, I think it was the combination of those factors. So that's why it became, in my opinion, uh, an international story. Um, as far as uh, why the Jewish people came together, um, there's a beautiful insight from Rav Sorotskin, um, where he says that basically the Jewish people are 15 million bodies, but we only have one soul. And he proves it beautifully in a, in a, in a verse uh, in, in one of the previous parashiot. Um, but he says that basically the Jewish people is one soul. In other words, your soul and my soul and, and the, all your viewers' souls are all one. And therefore, uh, when one person is, is hurt, we all feel it because it's actually ourselves. Uh, Rabbi Tatz, as I mentioned at the funeral, uh, puts it beautifully. He says that the Gemara says that if you have Siamese twins, um, the Gemara says, well, how do you know whether they inherit like one child or two child, two children, right? They get one portion of the inheritance or two. So he says the test is you pinch one of them and if the other one feels the pain, then they're one. That's the test, according to the Gemara. So he says, the Jewish people, he says, if you hurt one Jew and every Jew feels the pain, then there's definitely achdut, there's unity. Uh, it means that we're one people. So we have one soul. And that's why everybody felt the pain. That's really beautiful, the way you put it. You, what was created was something called D's Day. Could you tell us about D's Day, what it stands for? And also, I heard you say a beautiful mushal about a sandcastle. Right. So, okay, I woke up the night between the two Levias, right? And I just had the inspiration to do this flag thing um, and to call it D-Day. I actually was going to call it D-Day, but then, then I realized that there is such a thing called D-Day and there are a number right. of survivors of the Second World War who are probably now 95. And I could just imagine having a legal suit from a bunch of 95-year-olds claiming I've stolen their day. So we called it, <laughs> we called it these days. Um, I wrote a few things down on my phone uh, in the hospital where we, were, where we were sleeping. And then I woke up the next morning and I typed it out. I asked the mayor of a frat, Oded Ravivi, to call an international press conference, which wasn't sort of uh, obvious thing to do. It wasn't obvious that people would come to it. And yet they did. Um, and so I then wrote a little speech about... Um, how there's evil in the world and there's good in the world. And people are blaming the uh, good people for the evil. And it's a little bit like, um, you know, your daughter uh, builds a, a sandcastle and a little boy comes along and he kicks it over. And um, then uh, you go to the parents of the boy and say, look, you know, why did you kick it over? And they say, well, you built, uh, she built it. So if she hadn't built it, he wouldn't have kicked it over. That was, that was a sort of mashal. And, and that's in a sense, was trying to talk about the conflict here between the terrorists and the Jews in Israel, that we build, we build and they destroy. And, you know, their, their argument is that if we hadn't built, they wouldn't destroy it. But, you know, we, it's not going to stop us building because that's what we do. We're Jews. That's our, that's our, our tough kid, our purpose in life. Um, so what's interesting was actually, Yaakov, that people asked me, you know, why did I do this? And I couldn't tell you why I started these day and why I asked people to send these flags. But I can tell you retrospectively what it achieved. And this is what I tell people. The Jewish people are the world wide web of good in the world. Okay. So that means that each of us is a node in that network, 15 million nodes. And that means that if you have a good idea, if I have a good idea, if somebody has a good idea, they can pass that idea to somebody else in the network and they'll pass it on somebody else and they can spread it across the whole network. And then we can pass that good across the whole Jewish network. And because Jews are dispersed across the world, generally these ideas will disperse across the whole world. Uh, in fact, my book, which is called Transforming the World, uh, Jewish uh, Impact on Modernity, which is available on Amazon.com, uh, I talk about all this. Um, I talk about how all the good in the world, actually, all the, all the things that people, everyone, and Jews, and non-Jews, consider to be good in the world, actually come from the Torah and from the Jewish people. So that's, that's one of the messages. But, but, but in any case, um, this World Wide Web of Good um, uh, is there. And the problem was it hadn't been tested for 30 years, right? We, we were Jews fought against apartheid and Jews fought against black slavery and Jews fought against uh, Soviet Jewry and whatever. And we freed the Russians and we freed the blacks and we helped, we helped in so many different campaigns. But for 30 years, we've basically been playing Minecraft and sending pictures of our favorite food on Instagram. So we've been a little bit distracted by other things which we've thought are more important. So all I did by sending this, this uh, flag was what I call a ping test. A ping test means that when you have a network and you want to see that it's, it's, uh, it's co coherent or co cohesive, you send a ping, like a little signal down through the whole network. And if every node receives that signal, then you know the network is intact. 
And that's effectively what I did. So what happened was more than I expected, not only obviously that I see the network was intact, but every single person in the Jewish network felt and saw that it was intact. And now when I meet with groups of students, which I love to do, and they come to a frat, they come from all over the world and they come and meet me and I talk to them, I usually ask them, how many of you sent a flag? And half of them put their hands up. I said, how many of you received at least one flag? Every single one put their hand up. So, so everybody was aware the network is intact. That meant that Jewish unity was stronger than ever, that this network could be used by anyone. And Baruch Hashem, what I'm finding now, and this is the inspiring thing for me, is that at the beginning, I had like one or two uh, WhatsApps every, every day saying, because you know, for Meyer and for Rina and for, uh, and, and for um, Maya, for Rina and for Lucy, we're doing this following project in Australia, in America, in New Zealand. Um, and then, you know, a, a week later, it was three projects a day, and there was 10 projects a day. Yesterday, a guy came from the, uh, the Ministry of Education. He's responsible for 450 schools in Israel. He came with a book of 40 projects that they've set off to do um, that day, right? And I said to him, look, if, if you do that in two months' time, I'd be delighted to come, and we'll do a big uh, event, maybe at the Bini Neh Homar with 2,000 people. Invite all the people involved in these projects. Let them present to me a... Um, a video of what they've done, half an hour video, so I can see what, how they're progressing. I will address them. I said, you know, and this is what's happening around the world. People, people are doing these most amazing projects. Um, sometimes they're asking my permission. Hopefully they're not asking my permission. Sometimes they're doing it in the name of Meyer and Lucy and Rena. Sometimes they're doing it just, uh, just, just for the sake of, of, of doing it. But projects are taking place that are changing the world. And, and I can tell you 10 projects which each individually is changing the world and will continue to change the world. And every person, uh, this is what I say to these youth and the teachers that are there, every single person, not just Jewish or non-Jewish people, has one project at least which could change the world. Okay, And how do you know which one it is? You have a passion. If you have a passion, that passion is a message from God telling you you've got to do it now. now. Do it now. And change yourself with that passion. Then change your friend. Then if it works on you and your friend, it will work on a group. If it works in a group, it will work in a class. If it works in a class, it will work in your school. If it works in your school, it will work on your community. If it works on your community, it will work in other communities. If it works in other communities, it will work around the whole world. And, and that is the beauty of this Jewish network. Now we know it's working. We can use it. And, and uh, I went to an, a very inspiring event. It was the Mizrahi conference um, in um, Binyane Omar. Uh, again, 2,000 people were there. But I was speaking at 8 o'clock. Um, they asked me to come at 7 o'clock. At 7.30, they ushered me into this room with 150 yeshiva boys and SEM girls. And um, they told me they'd been asked to work on projects all day uh, that could change the world. And they wanted me to speak to them. So I said, look, I'll speak for five minutes. And then I want you to tell me about what projects you've decided to do. So one by one, they came up and I had time for about five or ten of them. And they told me these projects, every single project could change the world. So, so this concept that actually we have a network of good, a worldwide web of good that we can use for the benefit of mankind and for the whole Jewish community as well. Um, you know, it seems to be inspiring people to change uh, their lives and, and the lives of others for, for, the, for good. And uh, I, you know, that is, to me, the greatest comfort that one could possibly have. That's really incredible. I saw a video of uh, you and your family with someone that was a recipient of an organ uh, from your family member. Could, could you tell us a little about that? Uh, let me tell you so a couple of things. So first of all, um, when Lucy, when we were told that Lucy wasn't uh, basically was not alive, um, and uh, we said our goodbyes, um, they approached us at Adastri and Carib and said, "Would you consider donating our organs?" So, um, funnily enough, I'd already discussed this with Lucy. We discussed having organ donation cards and discussed it and said, in principle, we would like to donate our organs if we could, but we wouldn't carry a card because we traveled to England to see family. My parents live in Switzerland. If God forbid something happened abroad and they found this card, you know, they could switch off the machine when it was halachic clean. Uh, you're not dead. Mm -hmm. Um, and right. we wouldn't trust them. So we didn't have the card, but I knew that she wanted to donate her organs. So what I did is I have a rabbi in a frat. His name is actually Rabbi Frati. He's my posek. He is a genius. And I said to him, look, you speak to the rabbi, you speak to the doctor, you have the conversations. If it's halachically permissible in order to do this, uh, and, and what is it? You, you, you get them to write the contract, you check the contract, I will sign on the bottom. By the way, this was only after we had a family conference where we had a vote between the four of us. 
And as I say to people, because Yehud is a 14-year-old boy, he doesn't have an opinion. Uh, so therefore, really, the two girls made the decision uh, themselves to donate <laughs> the organs. It was really up to them. So anyway, we donated the organs. Uh, five lives were saved. Uh, one kidney, two, two kidneys, two lungs go to one person, one heart and a liver. Two corneas as well are halachically considered to be saving lives because uh, by halacha, someone who's blind is considered to be like they're dead. So effectively, she saved five to seven lives. Um, and um, we went to Bellinson Hospital to meet three of the recipients. And one of them, of course, was Lital, who was the heart recipient. And she said to me, uh, by the way, Rabbi D, said, my name is not Lital. It's, I would, my given name is Rina Lital, which was really quite spooky. Um, when hmm. I spoke to the mother of the 25-year-old boy who received the liver, who up to that point had never in his life been able to get out of bed for more than a few hours because he'd had this problem, uh, and was on his deathbed really the next week or two, um, she came up to me and said, thank you, Rabbi D. She said, uh, I said, what's your name? She, uh, she said, my name is Maya. Um, so we had a Maya and we had Arena. I'm sure there was a Leia somewhere in, you know, in, in the proceedings. That was really quite astonishing. Um, Anyway, the, the, uh, everybody, many people saw the picture of Karen listening to um, Lital's heart through a stethoscope. So she's effectively listening to Lucy's, her mother's heart, in Lital's body, and she's in tears. Um, so that picture went viral. Um, and in Israel, it's not uncommon for the donor to find out who the, um, the recipient is and vice versa, because it's a small country. And it was obvious in this case that, you know, we publicly said we were donating the organs and suddenly five people had life. Uh, and it doesn't happen that often in Israel. It's once a week or so that people actually once or twice a week. So pretty much they knew where it must have come from. Um, so they were happy to meet uh, the family. And um, that picture, as I said, went viral. So much so that I have a media advisor, Avi Hyman, who I don't pay. He's the best media advisor in, the, in, in Israel, uh, but he doesn't charge me a penny. Um, and um, he got a telephone call from the Daily Mail newspaper uh, uh, journalist and photographer who was standing at the coronation of Prince Charles on the Friday morning uh, on the Mall in England, waiting for him to go by. And, um, and they said, after the coronation, the moment it finishes, we want to fly out to a frat to interview Karen and Tully. Is that okay? So he's saying, wow. He says, you're flying out from the coronation straight to Frat to, to this house to sit here to speak to Karen and tell, yes, and we'll pay them a decent amount of money for the interview. So um, he didn't ask why, but uh, they wanted to talk about uh, organ, organ transplants. Um, and they did. Now, the Daily Mail, I didn't realize, has the biggest English uh, language website for news in the world, 350 million weekly views. Um, and they flew out here and they sat in the room over there and they interviewed Karen and Tully. And they, the, the whole article was to ask them the question, how did you feel when you heard the heartbeat of your mother in Lital's body? And they answered it, however they answered it. This went, you know, viral in Britain and became, you know, a, a great incentive for people to give uh, organs and sign for organ cards. Because up until now, I mean, I, I never thought about this. But you think when you give organs, it's such an altruistic thing to do, right? You know, why not? I mean, I'll do it, but I won't get any benefit from it. But you know what? Like everything else, uh, there's a word in, in the Torah, which is venatnu, uh, which means, uh, and they shall give. Um, and it's, it's uh, an acrostic or whatever the word is, a, a pal palagram. Palindrome. Pal palindrome. It, it reads the same backwards and forwards. And the idea is that when we give, we receive. And it's, it's absolutely true in terms of giving. Uh, that you receive more, more back than you give. That when we actually met the recipients of the, of these organs, it was such a tremendous comfort to us and to Karen and to Tully to see these people living because of their mother and to feel that a bit of their mother is still alive. Um, there couldn't be greater, a greater comfort to them. So that, you know, that message, which I think is a Kiddush Hashem, um, went out to 350 million people around the world with that photograph taken by, you know, uh, and, and organized by the Israeli hospital and doctors because that's what they do. Um, you know, keep it on I mean, that the you know, ideas, I mean, you, you think that in England they have 30 times the number of transplants than they have in Israel. And yet they had to fly a journalist and a photographer out to a frat, right, West Bank, in order to, <laughs> to have this interview. And what was, what was great for me as a parent and a great honor was that um, I came into the room about half an hour later because I had something else was going on that morning. 
Um, and I said to the, uh, the journalist and his, ca and his cameraman, I said, would you like a coffee and a piece of cake? And they said, no, 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 don't disturb us. We're right in the middle of something. They had no interest in meeting me, discussing anything with me. They just wanted to meet my daughters. And you know what? That is the greatest, uh, the greatest compliment, the greatest pride that a father can have. So, uh, you know, that was one of those moments. That's really beautiful. But, but, but let, me let, me let, me let me tell you something else. Um, I, sure. I don't know if you, if you heard this story, but um, one of Lucy's kidneys went to uh, an Arab Muslim Israeli who lives up in the north of Israel. So um, he gave me this plate as a gift. And actually recently I went up there to visit him and that will be on BBC television uh, because I had a friend of mine staying with me who was a BBC cameraman um, for the week, uh, filming my life uh, during the week of the Jerusalem Day Parade. Uh, when my life was completely manic, so I think I looked like a more of a sugar than I normally do. Uh, but in any case, <laughs> this plate, this plate basically reads in Hebrew uh, to to family D on the amazing altruism and light that you've given to us on your your wonderful donation. And then he quotes the following, which actually is from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin, and it says, "Therefore, man was created alone in the world to teach that anyone who takes one life." It's as if they destroy the whole world. And anyone who saves one life, it's as if they save the whole world. And then we say, we, we join in your pain, lots of love, and he gives his name at the bottom, uh, etc. cetera. So um, the uh, amazing thing is, um, first, first of all, this is one of my most precious possessions. I think it's just amazing. But I have a friend who is an imam um, in Haifa. And when I went to see him recently, I said to him, how would this, uh, this Muslim guy know to quote the most appropriate uh, Mishnah in Sanhedrin. I mean, how would he know it? Did he have a friend who was a rabbi? Is he a Talmud Chacham? Is he a, a Jewish expert? And he said to me, no, he said, you know what? He said, that's a direct quote from the Quran. So he brought out his Quran, which is translated to English, and he showed me a verse in the Quran, which was exactly this. In other words, he said to me, you know, the Quran uh, obviously has parts of the Torah. We know that. It talks about Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob, and Moses, and all the different characters. But it also has quotes from the Mishnah. It also has quotes from the Gemara because it was written after the Gemara was written. And as we know, uh, Muhammad lived in a place where there were a lot of Jews and Jews were involved in writing the, uh, the Quran with him. Um, and so there's some beautiful quotes in the Quran. And uh, you know, one of the quotes, by the way, says that the Jewish people will, uh, at some point in the future, all come back uh, to Israel and live in the land of Israel. Um, so that's in the Quran as well. <laughs> so, you know, figure that. So this guy, by the way, is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friend of Israel. And by the way, um, hopefully you'll hear more of this over the next week or two. Uh, the two of us have a plan to solve the conflict here in the Middle East between Arabs and uh, Israelis. Uh, he believes it is absolutely spot on what the Palestinians and Gazans want. Um, I believe it's spot on exactly what the Jews here want. Um, and we will announce it, please God, on Thursday. Uh, although I tell you something, it's very difficult to get the press uh, to be interested in you when, when you have something to say. When, when they want something from you, they'll ch chase you like, uh, like dogs. But <laughs> when you have something to say to them, uh, they're never there. So at the moment, I'm chasing them. And we'll see whether we get one or two interviews with the two of us uh, as he's in Jerusalem on Thursday. That would be the time we want to do it. Um, and we want to release this idea gradually into the network, the world network, and let it spread out a bit, let people comment on it. But I can tell you that all the experts I've spoken to in the Knesset and elsewhere have said, this, is, this could be a goer. And um, you talk about the, the Arab Spring, I'm calling it the Arab Summer, because I believe it could be completed by September. So, so we have you know, an amazing solution. Um, it looks very good for the good Palestinians and good Jews. I'll give you a hint. It doesn't look very good for the bad Palestinians uh, and the terrorists. But, uh, you know, uh, he, as a good uh, Muslim, understands that there are consequences when people murder in cold blood. So uh, that's fine. And uh, we'll see what uh, what comes of that. You kind of mentioned this idea before. There's always bad apples in every country, every religion. But very often you find, at least, you know, I guess in this conflict that that there's so much divisiveness. You know, I, I'm here in America and it feels like there's a lot of divisiveness, the Democratic, Republican, but it doesn't even pale into comparison to Israel-Palestinian conflict. How do you personally separate, you know, you just said this idea before that take away a life, you destroy worlds. And if you give life, you, you give so many worlds. So like, it's, it is beautiful that, you know, your wife's able to give life to others, but 
how do you separate the fact that at the end of the day, someone took away three of your most beloved family members from so, you? So, so Yaakov, somebody said to me something which I took as a great compliment. They were flattering me, so maybe I should have ignored it. But they said that you know, when this happens, a terror attack, said people usually go one of two ways. Um, half the people go and say, we hate every Arab in the world and they're all evil. And the other half go the other way and say, um, we love all Arabs and they start meeting up with mothers of terrorists and hugging them. Um, he said, apparently my case was quite unusual because my message was a little bit complex. It wasn't white and it wasn't black, it was sort of gray. I said, I love the Arabs and I hate the terrorists. I hate their leaders. And um, that was a slightly sophisticated message, which uh, it's interesting that uh, right-wing politicians in this country uh, thought was too complicated for their voters. Uh, even though they believed it themselves, they felt that they couldn't confuse people by actually saying, we do love a lot of Arabs, uh, because they might think that they're left-wing. Um, and left-wingers felt they couldn't say, we hate terrorists, because they thought that was a bit too complicated for their voters, because basically they might get confused and think we want to kill all Arabs. Um, and here I come along and say, well, actually, there are good Arabs and they're bad Arabs. And, you know, the good Arabs are the vast majority. The bad Arabs are the small minority. In order for the good Arabs to live a good life, uh, we have to ask them to uh, neutralize their bad Arabs. Um, and then basically we can step in to help them to build up their societies again in a free and democratic way. I think I might have sent you a map which uh, we produced, which shows the Freedom House scores for um, countries in the Middle East. And Freedom House is the international standard for measuring human rights. I know this because I worked in human rights for a couple of years, one of the 20 jobs I did, um, and, and came in useful, right? Um, Freedom House gives a score of 77, which means that Israel is free to, to Israel. It gives a score of 25 to the Palestinian territories, uh, which means it's not free. It gives a score of 14 to uh, Iran, not free. 12 to Gaza, not free and one to Syria, which is the lowest possible score. I think it just means that there is a leader and he has a pulse. Um, so um, maybe some countries in North America might score zero on that at the moment, but that's a, a political statement, which you're probably not allowed to uh, broadcast. Um, in any case, um, that, that's the situation. So if you look at a map and you draw a green map of uh, Israel, uh, which is actually the only free country, little red dots in the Palestinian territories, a red dot for Gaza, and red all around for all the Arab countries, what you see is that actually there are 100 million plus Arabs living in our neighborhood who are slaves, slaves to their non-democratic, non-free countries. They can't, they have no freedom of speech. They have no freedom of religion. They have no freedom to vote for the people they want. And even though they want peace with Israel, which the vast majority, pretty much everybody I met has said to me, we want peace with Israel. They can't say that publicly. In fact, I asked them to say it privately um, because I had a meeting with a senior leader um, yesterday in the Knesset. And I just wanted to show him that I have a lot of Palestinian friends and Arab friends who support peace. I said, just give me a voicemail without telling me your name. Pass it to a friend, pass it to the, from a friend to me. I can't track it to you. They were scared that their voice could be recognized on, you know, uh, even uh, that didn't know where this voicemail was going to go and that their voice would be recognized and they could be killed by Hamas. So they're so scared of Hamas that they can't come to my shiva, even though I invited them, although they did actually. Some of them loved me so much. I had about 10 Palestinian friends come secretly to the shiva, sat in the back room with me, comforted me, cried on my shoulder, um, risking their lives. But they, they can't do that. They could have come as the whole town, which they wanted to do. They checked it with the Palestinian Authority, and the Palestinian Authority made it very clear that they would kill them all. Um, and it's happened before in their town that people have been shot dead by Hamas operatives for getting a little bit too close to, uh, to Jews. So, so we live in, uh, in an environment where people want to have peace with us, but their leaders and the terrorists are scaring the hell out of them and making it impossible for them to actually progress. So anyway, our peace deal that uh, I'm working on with uh, my um, imam friend um, solves all these problems uh, quite, quite neatly. Um, but again, we need to release that on Thursday if, if the press are interested. Otherwise, it'll take another week or two before we find the right partner for that discussion. We'll be right back to this week's episode. And the, the last minute of this interview is actually my favorite because of a point that I make. You'll get there. You'll get there. But first... Let me tell you about Sparks of a Nation. It is a wonderful uh, WhatsApp group, WhatsApp status that 
I have no connection to. People think all the time that because this is called inspiration for the nation and that's called sparks of a nation that there's a connection, but there's no connection. If you want to see behind the scenes, beautiful moments in Claudia Stroll, the whether it's it's the the famous gedolim or rabbis or leaders that are that story that you didn't hear about them or just like the little snippets the little the people that you didn't know about but they're like doing tremendous acts of kindness or chesed or just like how people are making a kiddush hashem you will see it on sparks of a nation so go ahead and join the status it's 323-792-0613 it's free and it will add joy to your life. So go ahead and check out Sparks of a Nation. Now back to this week's episode. Okay, so this will be, be released Mustay Shabbos. I look forward to seeing the shame. peace plan. It's it's just for you describing it. I, I have no clue how you're going to figure it out. I, I think there's a lot of emotion and tensions in all directions. But I think if there's anyone who can understand the value of it, I definitely think it's you. So... A few weeks ago, I interviewed incre- the incredible Hill Fold. He's he's awesome. He actually connected us, and I I, I tweeted out uh, something about his brother, and I mentioned how his brother was killed, and right. someone very fearly called me out and said, "It's not enough to say his brother was killed. You have to say he was murdered." Right. Um, or I said he died, it, whatever it was there, like you have to say he was murdered. And I saw that you were interviewed. Was it by CNN? Or, or they mentioned the story and they totally got the whole story backwards. They they said something along the lines of like, it was a shootout. Uh, right. Could you tell us about what occurred yeah, with that? Christina, Christina Amapur um, uh, was uh, interviewing the prime minister, I think, of the Palestinian Authority. And in it, she asked him what he thought about the fact that three women were killed, three Jewish women were killed in a shootout. Uh, implying that m- my 15-year-old daughter, Rina, was shooting back at the terrorists. Um, and so, of course, you know, we were desperately upset by this as a family. And um, anyway, uh, I, I eventually received, uh, this went to honest reporting, became a big story. And eventually, Christine Amberpour sent me um, an email apologizing privately, and I, to which I replied, when somebody makes a, a statement in front of 100 million people and they uh, apologize to one, it has a 0.000001% impact. Uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, starting to be a maths teacher when this all happened and I've given that up. So another one of those skills that uh, came in useful was being able to work out the percentage impact of her statement. Um, so in the same time, I get a telephone call from Richard Green, who's the head of the CNN uh, office in Jerusalem. He's a Jew, um, but you wouldn't know that from the way he spoke to me. Um, I said to him, uh, Richard, are you drawing a moral equivalence between my suffering and the suffering of the mother of a terrorist um, who was killed by the um, Israeli Defense Forces in order to neutralize the risk of him murdering more innocent civilians? And Richard said to me in these words, he said, we, will, we don't agree on this, he said, but I do feel, understand that you feel pain about your loss. Um, so I said, Richard, I said, you make me sick. I said, in fact, uh, CNN makes me more angry than the terrorists made me. I said, because the terrorist was some uneducated guy uh, who was brainwashed from the day he was born by his teachers and his parents. He pulled the trigger. I said, you, CNN, cannot be described as misinformed. You're the most informed people on the planet. You know exactly what's going on here. And you're lying and you're evil. And you're doing this in order to sell a few uh, adverts so you can sell lots of cheap Chinese products to people who don't actually need them and a lot of petrol to fuel cars which are basically polluting the planet. So I said, you, you guys are evil and I have no time for you. And I put the phone down. Um, so that was Richard Green. Um, and, uh, you know, CNN is an evil organization because they're spreading evil. I blame them for killing my wife and my uh, daughters. And I've said this a number of times because they incite uh, murder by creating a moral equivalence between uh, between the, the murderers and the victims. Um, and they do it in a, in a particularly professional and educated way. And it wasn't just Christina Anamapur. If it was just her, then you know maybe that was one thing. I had an interview with uh, with Christina uh, McFarlane uh, two or three weeks before that. And besides some of the very offensive things she said to me during the interview, which I don't need to repeat here, um, at the end of the interview, she said, uh, she said, thank you, Rabbi D. She said, uh, after the break, we're going to go to a, a Palestinian who has exactly the same experience as Rabbi D, but from the other side. 
So, of course, I'm thinking to myself, excuse me, where is that Jewish terrorist who just murdered three Palestinians in cold blood with a Kalashnikov and 20 bullets? Because I've never heard of him. Not in the last 30 years, there's been no uh, Jewish terrorist that I know of who's killed Palestinians in cold blood. So if she's making a moral equivalence between me and some random mother of a terrorist who's been killed by the IDF, then frankly, uh, you know, she is more evil than Christina Amapur. So, um, so you know, we have a number of different arguments against CNN. Uh, we've got a $1.3 billion uh, lawsuit that we are planning uh, against them. Uh, the one way that they could possibly redeem themselves is um, by having a meeting uh, between myself and David Zaslav, uh, who is the new uh, uh, owner of CNN. Uh, and I'm prepared to have that meeting uh, because I do believe that they can actually change the spots. Uh, there is something in, in uh, Judaism we call uh, tshuva me'ahava, that uh, if you do repentance in the right way, you can actually turn your sins into uh, merits. And I believe that CNN, if they turned around now, could actually become an agent for peace instead of being the warmonger, uh, terror uh, media organization that they are. Wow. Um, it's really wild and uh, very hurtful for what they did. If you could go back in time and just stay in England, would you do that? No. Um, I'll tell you what happened, actually, Yaakov. Um, about 2009, we'd been in England for about a year. Lucy woke up one morning and she said, we need to sell our house in England. Uh, we also had a flat and we need to sell our assets in England. We need to convert our money into shekels. We need to buy a property in a frat because the only place we can bring up Jewish kids is in Israel and I want it to be in a frat. Now, this was odd for a number of reasons. Number one, because neither of us had been particularly Zionistic until we came to Israel the first time for four years, but we'd just come back from there, so I guess that was understandable. Secondly, Lucy had no idea about currency, and she had no idea about property prices. <laughs> so she woke up with this vision, and I sold the house, and I sold the flat, and um, I went out a few months later, February 2010. I bought this house uh, without her being here because she was looking after five young kids. Um, and, um, and that was when the pound was six and a half to the shekel, six and a half shekels to the pound. Um, and this basically for the price of our house in England, we could have bought three of these, um, three of these houses here in a frat. Today, I'm telling you, this house is worth twice the value wow. of that house now in England because the pound collapsed and the property prices in a frat have gone through the roof. And what I'm telling your viewers, if they're in America, is sell your house in America, sell your house wherever you live, and buy something in Israel because the dollar is going to crash. The pound is already crashing. Um, it will go to parity. It will go to one dollar to the shekel. It will go to one pound to the shekel. Whether that be in the next five years, 10 years, I don't know. If you have a mansion in Manhattan, you'll be able to sell it in 10 years time and buy a small studio apartment in the middle of the desert if you're lucky. So I'm telling people, you know, you want to make, uh, you want to make, you want to have a future for your kids. Um, the only place to be is here. And Lucy would be saying the same thing. We have no regrets and this is the place to be. And in terms of, you know, I, I, I feel sometimes I'm not a very good advert for uh, Israel because what happened to me. Um, and in fact, one of the nasty things that Christina McFarlane said to me was, uh, Rabbi D, this would be one of the worst years for uh, terror in Israel, hasn't it? So I, I said to her, for me, it's been the worst year for terror. I said, statistically, however, um, it's been one of the better years for terror. 19 people were killed in three months. That's a run rate of less than 80. Uh, you can work it out during the year. Okay, that's less than the number of people are stabbed on the London Underground, or at least in London town, um, in a normal year. Um, and it's less than, you know, probably in, in, in many cities in America, uh, people who are murdered every, you know, within a month. Um, so, you know, it's a very small number unless it happens to you. Um, and I want to tell you something, Yarkov. The life expectancy here is five years longer than the life expectancy in America. That means that if you move to Israel, you have a chance of living five years longer, not five years less. Uh, and that's because we, we have a healthier diet, we have less cancer, we have less uh, heart disease, we have a, a much better climate, um, and, um, and we're much healthier generally than Americans. So, you know, coming to Israel is a way of extending your life. And despite this small noise in the background, which is called terror, unless it happens to you, in which case it's a very large noise, um, basically, this is one of the safest places to be. My kids would come back at night in a frat, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. We would be asleep. We wouldn't care. Perfectly safe here. Um, my daughter, Rena, would go up to the, uh, to the Kinneret, to the Sea of Galilee, with her friends, age 14, 15. They'd sleep uh, on mats by the Kinneret. 
Uh, they bring food with them. They bring a pakal, which is a little gas heater. They eat their food, they swim in the Canaret, they spend two or three nights there and come back. I'd give her 50 shekels, which is whatever, you know, uh, uh, 10 pounds, which is what, $15 or something to take up with her for emergency money. She'd bring it back. She'd have a free holiday for three days, sleeping by the side of the Canaret, swimming in the Canaret. Um, you know, this is the life that we lead in Israel. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the only place to be. It's, it's paradise. And the economy here is growing. The, the shekel is getting stronger. We've got, north, we've got gas coming out of our ears at the moment from the Mediterranean, which is strengthening the shekel. There's a shortage of housing. House prices went up 30% last year. Um, you know, I, I couldn't, I, I think Hillel Fould did a very good job of selling the technology here. I couldn't do as good a job as he does, but it's clear that every technology company in the world wants to be here. Uh, I had a friend actually who was running HP for a while in Tel Aviv. And he told me that, um, this was about eight, nine years ago, he said that every technology company in the world has to have three R&D centers. He says they have one in India. He says that's for solving problems that they know they have. He says they have uh, one and, and they know how to solve. He says they have one in Silicon Valley. That's for solving problems they know they have, but they don't know how to solve. And he says they have one in uh, Israel that's for solving problems that they didn't know they had in the first place. Um, and if you read the story about the startup nation and the story about Intel, where the Israeli uh, engineers saved Intel from destruction because they had the guts to stand up to the management and say, you're doing the wrong thing. Um, and no other junior uh, engineers in that company would have done that. But the culture in the Israeli army is such that if people are told to do the wrong thing, they stand up to the generals, they tell them you're doing the wrong thing. Um, uh, that was, that sort of saved Intel and, and many other companies. Incredible. Well. For someone watching this who has gone through a tragedy, has gone through a major loss in their life, what advice would you have for them? I, I talked to the, the Leviah. Um, I said, look at the good and not the bad. I mean, that, that's the question of Emunah. Um, Rav Ephraim Goldberg says that actually Emunah is a muscle, which means you have to actually exercise it regularly. So that means that if you want to use it when you need it, when things go bad, it may not be strong at that point. So the way to exercise the emunah muscle is that when things are going well in your life, to always say Baruch Hashem, say thank you to God, and to appreciate where that's coming from. Because if you do that, when things go badly, you can use that energy, you can use that muscle, it's already fit. If you don't do that, and you say when things are going right, well, well I was clever, what a great job I did. Then, then you don't have the skills and the ability to, to, uh, to, to use that uh, when you need it. What has been the impact that you've had on since that tragic day? So apart from working on world peace, as, as we talked about, and please God, that will, um, that will come out in the next few weeks. Um, I'll tell you that during the Jerusalem Day parades, I was working on every single politician in the Knesset who I thought could control it. Uh, knocking on their door and they open the doors to me at the moment because of you know what happened to me so I can open doors and um, I shouted at them told them you have to shut the uh, Shah Shrem which is the entrance to the Muslim quarter because you know that there'll be a bunch of yeshiva boys will turn up and will dance around and sing death to the Palestinians and that that will be the story that will be captured by CNN and other anti-Semitic uh, stations around the world. And half a billion people will see this. It's terrible Khil Hashem, a terrible uh, stain on the Jewish people. And they will make uh, an equivalence between them and uh, the terrorists dancing around saying kill the Jews. And obviously we know that it's very different singing a song in the street. Uh, it's very unpleasant, but it's very different to uh, terrorists who actually do go out and kill Jews. Um, but that is exactly the moral equivalence that's made. And I, and I spoke to all the major rabbis uh, individually. I spoke to all the major politicians individually, and I put pressure on them, and I did not succeed. However, um, I told you about this uh, guy who came to my house with uh, 40 projects from 450 yeshivas and seminaries, uh, yeshiva high schools, and basically, in, in Israel. And I showed him the video of the boys who actually were dancing this Jerusalem day, outside uh, in, the, in the Muslim quarter. And I said, are these your boys? So he said, yes. I said, can you identify them? He said, yes. I said, I want you to promise me that you will bring them in front of one of the top rabbis in Israel, Rabbi Lau, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, Rabbi Weitzman, who's head of Malot, and Bnei Kiva. I said, I want them, the rabbis to give them very strict uh, tochacha telling off. 
I want them to give them a whole lesson on what it means, the Chil Hashem, which is to basically desecrate God's name. And then I want them to be given a project to clean up the streets in the Arab quarter of Jerusalem, uh, or another project that is demanded is, is useful to the Arab uh, residents of Jerusalem. And by the way, I want this whole thing to be put onto a film and I want it to be shown to all the 450 schools uh, in, your, in your network. I said, do I have your agreement? He said, yes. Okay, so, you know, can we stop this happening ne next year? I don't know. You know, is it likely to happen next year if we get this done? I'm hoping it's not. So, you know, personally, I would have closed the, uh, the gate uh, to the Muslim quarter. I didn't think it was necessary to open it. Unfortunately, the politicians in this country felt that by closing it, they would look weak somehow to right-wing supporters. I think there's about five right-wing supporters on a hill somewhere in the West Bank uh, who would probably care. Um, and everybody else really wouldn't turn a blind eye. But there's this imaginary uh, concept that there's lots of right-wingers who, who really need to have the, uh, the, the, the wisdom court open on Jerusalem Day. But hopefully that's one way that I have made a bit of a difference in Israel this year. That is uh, very incredible. So you, you wrote this very wonderful book called Transforming the World. And you wrote it about 11 years ago, and it's available for anyone to buy online. We'll have a link in the show notes. You can buy on Amazon. You can buy, well, we'll go to the link, and I highly recommend to buy it. And it's filled with a lot of ideas that you mentioned in this podcast. And of course, we just touched the tip of the iceberg. So people should go ahead and buy it. But I found, for me personally, the most powerful line in your book, obviously, was not planned out and I, I want to read this in the beginning of the book you dedicated the book and you wrote for my beautiful wife lucy and my remarkable children maya karen tali rena and yehuda you are my inspiration and i just found that everything that you're doing now and truly trying to transform the world is so presented in your family and where you came from and what you guys stand for. And, you know, I, I named this show Inspiration for the Nation, but I, I couldn't think of a more appropriate person and as well as your kids, they should be guests here also. But uh, what you guys are doing and how you're walking, walking with what happened to you and not keeping your head down and, and really being an inspiration for the nation, I, I need to personally thank you. So thank you. I thank, thank you for your time. Um, I, I want to just close off with this beautiful song, um, and we're going to play it. And for anyone who's who's listening, I highly rec recommend you go watch this video. Rabbi, could you just finish off uh, explaining what this song is about? Sure. So um, what happened was about a week after the Shiva, I got a call from um, a great uh, is uh, Israeli, English, American singer called Sh uh, Shimon Kramer. And he said, look, I'd like to dedicate a song specifically to Lucy and Maya and Rina. Um, I've got this song, Anima Min, which I think is absolutely fitting for them. And I want it to be in their memory. And I said to him, Shimon, let me tell you something. I said, during the Shiva, I kept reading the same verse two or three times a day, which was Kadosh, 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 Hashem Tzvakot, Melokal Arz Kodah, which is from Isaiah 6, 3. And it, it basically means, uh, holy, holy, holy is God. May the whole world be full of his glory. And I said, every time I said it, it started resonating with me in a different way. I was thinking, holy, that's Lucy. Holy, that's Maya. Holy, that's Rena. And because of them, the whole world is going to know about God's glory. Um, I said to Shimon, I said, is there any chance you could incorporate that verse into this song? Because if you could, it would mean so much to me. And Shimon said, I'm onto it. And the next thing I hear is like two or three weeks later, he sends me the first cut. And it's the most beautiful uh, song I've ever heard. And when I watch it with the video and the pictures of my wife and my kids, it brings me to tears. But uh, as, as we say in the video, they're tears of hope, um, you know, tears of, of pain, which turn into tears of hope. So I hope that people uh, enjoy the song. I hope that it gets played a lot on American uh, radio, on uh, Israeli radio, on television. Um, and I'm hoping that it will become the song that's uh, played and maybe sang live at Yom HaZikaron um, next year at the Tekes, uh, the, the, uh, the big event 
um, at Har Herzl. So, um, you know, it's an anthem for hope uh, in times of tragedy, and I appreciate you playing it now. As I'm about to say the Pesach, Kadosh, 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 Hashem to the court, God of Arts, God of Kadosh Lucy, Kadosh Maya, Kadosh Rina, the local Arts, God of because of them, the whole world will be full of Hashem's glory. Ani mami behayem na shalema Beviyat hamashia Odi yafalpi v'yafalpi Shayit mamehya Im kol ze achakelo Kadosh, Kadosh, Kamadosh Hashem Tzivakot Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode with Rabbi D. If you got this far in YouTube, you could go ahead and leave the word powerful. So I personally know that you watch till the very end and I will 
respond to your comment. I look at every single comment and I am telling you, I will respond to every comment this week, or you could share any other feedback or favorite moments from this episode. I, as you probably heard in my voice, I was like nervous. I was so nervous and I, I don't really get nervous, but I think I was intimidated. We you have someone here who, who lost his wife and two daughters and he's, he's, has so much amuna and betachen and you see him trying to like make achdos and try to like heal the world and to me that's that's very inspiring um a word that gets thrown out around here a bunch and i felt like i had a tremendous achrayas responsibility and also a tremendous opportunity to sit with him so I don't get nervous anymore with talking to people, but I got nervous here. I think it's also the component that that he was in Israel and I'm in New York. It's always a little harder to connect, um, just to hear each other. So um, you 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 who watch this, you you're you're getting spoiled because we I didn't hear it as clearly or see him as clearly as you did. But hopefully you enjoyed the conversation. You got inspired. You get chazek and. And you, you take that inspiration and you do something with it. You know, I, I think so often it's so easy to get inspired. I really think it's easy to get inspired. But to take that and to turn that into an action the same way that Rabbi D is, is to, he's taking his pain and he's saying, how could I use my pain to help others, to understand others, and to make the world a better place? I think that is a definition of an inspiration for the nation. We have so many more tremendous episodes coming up. So go ahead and subscribe if you haven't yet. And if you would like to sponsor an episode, Li'ilu Nishmas, a loved one, uh, it's something that we're going to be talking about a lot more here. Uh, you could go ahead and send an email to hi at livinglechaim.com. That's H-I at livinglechaim.com. We would love to explain to you the benefits, the schus, and how many people watch and listen. I just saw a stat the other day. It literally is a random day, and I've seen it higher, but um, my, my, my good buddy, uh, Yechiel, said I should mention this, that in the past 48 hours, we've had over 50,000 people watching a video from Living L'chaim. And I checked it. It was like, it wasn't even necessarily new stuff. So Living L'chaim, thank God in numbers, we're growing. Um, as of today, we're over 140,000 YouTube subscribers. Fun fact, we're the largest original content uh, from Orthodox YouTubers out there. I think Shizoli is at the top. Um... From from like a media standpoint, I think Rabbi Manus Friedman is is also, but he's like a person. But from a content standpoint, that we create our own content, we're we're there. We are there, and we're growing. So if you haven't yet, yet yet subscribed, go ahead. And we have so many shows. Whether it's Kosher Money, that's an issue. Spirit of the Song, or Not Your Typical Podcast with Charlene. We have a few more shows in the works, and we're just getting started. And we it's it's the amount of inspiring people. It's. I'm drowning in so it, it's there's too many there's too many and is the best problem to have and you have so many suggestions so go ahead and leave us your suggestions on living we have a special tab there and um, don't text me or tweet me or Instagram me like it's it's great actually you could but like I tell everyone please go to the website because I, I can't keep up there are so many beautiful incredible people in Clyde as well so um, yeah keep on being inspiring.